this this talk actually goes back a very long time uh, to to before the year two thousand when I was asked by a hyperactive children's support charity to do some library work um, looking at different elements that that um, factored into what is or is not hyperactivity and what what seemed to really float to the surface was that there was a lot of research uh, showing that some additives, some food additives, uh, cause hyperactivity and trigger people. And uh, I, my job was to find that information and put it in an easy way for people to understand. Uh, because some people it, feel like they're being dragged through a hedge backwards <laughs> when uh, I, I talk about the science. So I'm going to drag you through some hedges, uh, but hopefully uh, keep it light enough that you'll walk away with some understandings where you, you're equipped yourself to find out what you need to know about food additives and indeed other chemicals. Um, uh, now, the f what was really obvious was that uh, looking at the diets of some of the these these family and children, there were some trigger products. And uh, I certainly remember as a child drinking Kiora. <laughs> Does anybody remember Kiora? When Smarties were very enlivening. Yes. <laughs> um, and I, 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 something like 10 years ago, I, I remember being astonished. I was standing by a sweetie counter and all these school children rushed in. And they also were talking to each other, pointing at these different sweets and going, oh, that one gets you really, really hyper, brilliant. And they were buying them <laughs> <laughs> and eating them and then whizzing around the place. Um, <laughs> so I, uh, I, I started looking, looking into these and found a really good book. There's a book called uh, E for Additives which is, uh, it, it's older, but it's still good in many respects. The, the research links all back to very robust uh, studies. And it, it's, it's quite a good reference book. Now to make it super simple, one of the things I did was I looked at all the all the additives, and I thought I'd create a list of food additives that are banned by one or more countries, knowing that a country doesn't tends not to legislate like that lightly. It's a very costly process, and it it, it uh, causes all kinds of um, upset, I, I suppose. So think about. Uh, conversations in Blackpool, you know, right? Well, you, you can't use that in your, your sticks of rock anymore. The whole business has to change. The whole supply chain has to change. But this was a way of, of really parsing very simply what, uh, what was in the food for people and what, what were the easy things to avoid. Um, I, and I, I continued researching food and the food chain, and uh, it took me deeper and deeper into it. I, has anybody seen the film Food Incorporated? It's a tremendous documentary. So it's, it's a very good documentary looking at how the global food chain has evolved or developed. Um, because, of course, we go into the supermarket and you, you look at all of these different things or, you know, any shop and they, they come from all over the world. Um, 
and it, say buying chicken, a chicken today is very, very different from buying one a hundred years ago because the, the scale of production has gone so vast that many of these chickens never see what they, you could call a natural environment, you know, some, something they co-evolved with over however million years. But that, that, that documentary kind of opens the door on the chemical nature of our food chain. There are lots of foods that are formulated, for example, from food matrices. <laughs> they, they're these, these industrial chefs, if you like, are given a list of ingredients that are in said warehouses, and they can call on all of these different things and combine them to make this, that, or to other. Um, and... In Food Incorporated, there's a wonderful section of it which shows just how many molecules they've managed to derive from corn. And it's, it, it's, it's startling science. It, it's really interesting. And we walk into supermarkets and we can see apples and fruit. And, uh, I found out that apples can be picked um, and stored in a nitrogen at atmosphere to prevent them from going off. Because um, nitrogen is very unreactive. And, and they can be picked up to a and stored for up to a year before then being artificially ripened by uh, ethylene gas and put on the shelves. So these, these are effectively immature fruits. And the range of nutrients that are um, in a, uh, an apple, say, ripened in the wild under circumstances they've co-evolved with, is a, is a lot broader. And you get, I, I think it's clear, a lot better, better and more complex flavors. Um, so... We, we've ended up with um, the additive system. Why are there all these E numbers? Uh, and the, 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 the reaction is to go, E numbers are bad. <laughs> I, I have, I've met people who try to avoid all E numbers, which is nigh on impossible in, in an industrial uh, city. Um, but I remind people that E300, for example, is vitamin C, ascorbic acid, without which we wouldn't survive. It's, it's very good as an antioxidant. So it prevents things from going off. Um, so the E, e system came about, uh, I think, through pragmatic warehousing. Uh, whenever said company wants to make a biscuit or whatever, they'll say to all the people working in the warehouses, right, we need a barrel of this and a barrel of this and a barrel of this and a barrel of this. But they go off into these massive places and try these barrels of act and mix them all up and we end up uh, with um, the, the products they make. Um, so they're whilst they share uh, the, the E number system, they don't necessarily sh share the same properties. Um, and uh, what was very interesting, uh, and this, this is a practical demonstration of some of the problematic E numbers. So I think we'll mostly be familiar with DVDs, so can everybody, everybody's looked at a CD or a DVD. And you can see all the rainbow colors. And we can take oil and pour it on water and get that, see the same peacock effect. Now, these, 
Yep. Uh, these are used to colour food. These are known as azel dyes. And uh, things like uh, E102, uh, tartrazine, and this is prohibited in uh, Norway and Australia. Bearing in mind, this is information taken from uh, Maurice Hansen's E for additives. Uh, so there may be more, more things that are banned in more places now. It's, as far as I can see, relatively uncommon for things to be uh, declassified, to, to go from a banned status to, oh, well, we've decided this is completely untoxic now. <laughs> so the yellow in this, which is also known as CI19140, or FD and C yellow 5, uh, or E104 is quinoline yellow, uh, which is prohibited in Norway, the USA, and Austria, Austria and Japan. Um, and there's... Uh, do you want me to read out all, all the ones that are, are, are banned? Uh, uh, well, let's see. What E104, 107 yellow... E one hundred ten, E one hundred twenty two, E one hundred twenty three, E one hundred twenty four, E one hundred twenty seven, one two eight red, E one three two, one three three brilliant blue, E one four two, green S. E151 black. I'll put this all on the website. <laughs> so, yeah. um, but I, and it goes on. We've got we've got a longer list, uh, and I, I I will put all of this that, that I'm covering on the website with the references. And for me, this this is probably the important part. How do we as individuals access reliable information about? Uh, assessing, is this safe to put into my, my body? Um, and and that's, that's the story behind the, uh, the, the sort of moving into this area. Because uh, interestingly, uh, in, in this particular organization, once families had screened the, the additives, um, about 80 to 90 percent, uh, like most, most hyperactivity <laughs> seemed to uh, disappear. I, I, and they, they were, and they, the families were very uh, concerned initially because they didn't want to medicate young children with strong stimulants like methylphenidate or uh, amphetamines or. Um, so I, I also provided information like the, the British National Formulary is a very good source of information and it's publicly open to access. And if you look at the side effects of, say, Ritalin, methylphenidate, there are a number of problems. One of the problems being the drug can cause hyperactivity. <laughs> So, uh, it, yeah, that, that, that's, that's where I, I started all of this. Um, and, and pointing out to people that, yeah, what we eat does, it radically affects our, our behavior and things like uh, uh, the way we're parsing the world. Like, one, uh, have you heard of the, the term nootropic? <laughs> it's, it's all over the internet. Like, there's lots of companies selling nootropics. They used to be called smart drugs. 
take yeah. this and you'll become a wonderful studier and take in all of this information. Um, if you look at water and its effect is, um, effects on cognition, uh, it, it's very startling. If somebody's dehydrated, or we become, we lose all sorts of abilities. So that's a, a rudimentary way that these things can affect us. But going going to things like the azo dyes. So so these are benzene derivatives, and they've they've got a benzene ring in them, and that is uh, it, it's mimics the uh, catecholamines, the, the adrenals, uh, adrenaline, noradrenaline, dopamine, because these also have uh, that, that phenolic ring. Um, and uh, the, uh, was it Sally Bundy? There, there was a, a great campaigner who noticed these things and campaigned very hard and was involved in getting our food labeled. If you're selling us food, we want to know what's in it, and we want to know that it's safe. And uh, Sally Bundy, I think it was, her hyperactive children's support group, uh, her, the lists of things to avoid were, were brought together by families, noting, <laughs> when my youngster <laughs> eats this, they're, they're bouncing off the walls, or... <laughs> They've become terribly depressed, or uh, they, they, their mood alters. Interestingly, we we're hearing more and more of these things about technology too now. So there are question marks hanging over uh, the effects of uh, people's digital experiences, but that's a talk for another day. <laughs> um, so, I think there's a, a, a real need to problematize the medicalization of behavior and obviously scrutinize the chemicals we come into contact with. So things like uh, fire retardants that come in new carpets and sofas and chairs, textiles, these can uh, be powerfully disrupt hormones. Uh, in particular, women and, and girls. Um, and then there are the sulfites. And sulfites are very strong triggers of allergic reactions. In some situations, fatally, there were uh, situations, uh, was it the 70s or the 80s? Anyway. In the US, they had salad bars and they were spraying their salad with sulfites so that the lettuce. <laughs> <laughs> it didn't go brown, basically. <laughs> it, 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 but people were keeling over with uh, anaphylactic shock and, you know, you know deadly asthmatic attacks. So they passed certain laws and tightened regulations there. But there are a lot of people with asthma, eczema, Crohn's disease, arthritis, hay fever, who don't know that there's a very long and evidenced link between these additives that we get uh, in, and all sorts, from, from fruit squashes to, to meats. Um, and um, uh, th these dangerous uh, allergic reactions. There, there's also th things like nitrates and nitrites. So you find these in preserved meats uh, and uh, I think some cheeses. But th these are, co are causing, there, there's a very strong correlation with bowel cancers. Um, and the, 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 the media seems to deal with this like a pantomime. It's, you know, one week we get, oh no it isn't, 
Next week you get, oh yes it is, you know, <laughs> the dame's over there, the villain's over there, you know. Next week the the vitamins are, are all, you know, they don't do anything, you know. Uh, there's, the, the media is a great place to lose the truth. Um, and we're, we're slipping into a, a world of infotainment. Um, so that's so why I, I, I got rid of my telly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it, was, it was great, great to have that freedom in my life from this noxious box. <laughs> anyway, um, then we've got things like uh, flavor enhancers, um, uh, like uh, monosodium glutamate. And this is well known for causing uh, what's called excitotoxicity. In the in elderly people, in the young, and uh, people who are unwell, and what happens here is so glutamate is actually a neurotransmitter. It's part of how our bodies communicating and coordinating our bio, neurological and biological activity, and it excites nerve cells. So when it's in food, we put some, some on our tongue and the, the flavors are much more vivid. So it causes the neurons to, to fire and fire and fire until they become exhausted and die. Oh, God. So ex the, the, this is very, very well documented. Uh, area of, of, of science, ex the excitotoxicity of glutamate. Glutamate's also been associated very strongly with mechanisms of addiction and various psychiatric um, uh, ailments. Uh, so how, how, do we, how do we work out? <laughs> So, how do we survive it? Okay. Well, how do we? So yes, well, th this is it. Um, uh, we. It's very hard to avoid everything, um, and uh, my short answer is that there's a beautiful and mature body of science which we can look at. When whenever something goes into our body there are certain things our body uses to metabolize and then excrete whatever we take in. Certain things have a natural place in our body. So glutamate actually has a, a natural place in our body. And the enzyme which, or one of the enzymes which acts to metabolize glutamate is pyridoxal 6-phosphate. No. Paradoxal 5 phosphate. Um, so vitamin B6 can mitigate to a certain extent uh, high levels of glutamate uh, amino acids. It's an amino acid, it's a protein that's, that's in us. Um, so, so we can look at the, the biologic, work out the biological costs of something. When we take uh, an aspirin, for example, it does its job. It may, might uh, reduce a, a dangerous fever by, um, by blocking, I think it's a cyclooxygenase 2 pathway. This is an enzyme that makes prostaglandins. Um, and it prevents those, that, that pathway from, from happening. But when the aspirin's done its job, then the body has to get it back out. And it makes, the, the body has the cost of something called glucuronic acid. Glucuronic acid is a little molecule that turns fat-soluble molecules water-soluble. So then they can flow out through the urine. Natural aspirins we, we find in things like tomatoes. So uh, much smaller amounts, but 
when, when somebody's taking 300 milligrams of aspirin, that's got a biological cost we can largely quantify. And I, I think we've got the to toxicological information to understand how to, to uh, mitigate these things. But of course, the first uh, most sensible act is to remove them. If it, if it is toxic, let's not uh, expose ourselves and others to it. And of course, the, the legis uh, legislation has matured over years uh, as terrible mistakes and uh, uh, on occasion um, bad ethics have exposed people to um, certain toxins. And out of this legislation, uh, uh, paperwork uh, grew called the Material Data Safety Sheets. Is, is anybody familiar with these? They are gorgeous because they're simple. <laughs> so th think about uh, Jill, she's working in the warehouse, she's been told, go off and get uh, 100 kilos of uh, E300. Right? Now, if she's working on the forklift truck and it spills, and goes everywhere. All the people working in that warehouse have to clean that up. And there's certain things that have to be known for simple safety. And on the material data safety sheets, there are 16 sections of information which are helpful for uh, workers and emergency uh, people, people who are going to an emergency. Maybe, maybe there's a fire. And also recently, <coughs> ecological information has been added to this. So when we pour something down a drain, and it gets onto the streams, you know, into the waterways, how does it affect microbes? How does it affect uh, amphibians and fish and the like? Um, so... To give you an idea, um, the section one of a, uh, a material data safety sheet, these, these are all free to download. Uh, I always tend to download multiple ones and see whether there are any differences because particularly the ecological information that's come later, been added later, is, might be absent. In, in in one um, and section one you'll find a very concise it's all very concise it's all at a glance information um, identification of the substance mixture of the company undertaking section two is the hazards identification section three is the compos composition uh, and information on the ingredients. <coughs> um, section four is the first aid measures. Section five, firefighting measures. Section six, accidental release measure. Section seven, handling and storage. Section eight, exposure controls and personal protection. Section nine, physical and chemical properties. Section 10, Stability and reactivity. Section 11, toxicological information. And that's, that's, that's the section I, I suggest people. You can quickly get look at the side of your shampoo bottle or your deodorant or your cereal and you couldn't go online and go, what's legislation said about the, the information that needs to be known in, with handling this substance. Um, I won't, won't take you through all 16 <laughs> sections, but, but material data safety sheets, they're free, they're protected by legislation, it's very robust, very concise. 
Um, and there's uh, an article that I will share with you all that takes you through reading all of this. And uh, for example, sodium benzoate. Uh, have you seen it in foods and drinks? Yeah. <laughs> it's the sodium salt of benzene. And it's used as a preservative. You know, you'll find it in uh, uh, certain fizzy drinks, for example. And uh, the... Now, uh, well, I did have one prepared earlier. <laughs> Um, it's identified as very problematic. Uh, l later on, I'll call up that material data safety sheet. And some, uh, I, I pointed this out to uh, some, uh, some people. And there was somebody who said, well, you can't say that sodium benzoates toxic uh, because it's got benzene in it. That's like saying table salt is toxic because it's got chlorine in it. Chlorine gas uh, disastrous. But I did point out we would have warnings if when we added table salt, sodium chloride, to our foods, if there was some way that that sodium and chlorine were to separate and release the gas, it, it is a genuine uh, mm. health consideration. I pointed out a, a peer-reviewed article showing that sodium benzoate, dis, uh, the, the sodium dissociates in the presence of iron and vitamin C. So if you show me a diet without iron and vitamin C, I'll show you a diet where it's safe to consume sodium benzoate. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, so come. Coming forward a number of years, uh, I, I remember uh, the food label, labeling being a lot better than we've got now. Um, now we're seeing creeping in interesting uh, addendums to, to the ingredients list going, oh, the flavorings. Yes. <laughs> it, it's, it's obfuscation. And I think we we are due for updating the legislation to include newer inventions of the, the food industry. Um, has anybody eaten Pringles, perhaps? Pringles crisps, famously, once you pop, you can't stop. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> and have you noticed that uh, about two thirds of the way through the tube, you're going, oh, I can't, I can't, but I must. <laughs> uh, I, I now hate them as much as I loved them at the beginning, but I'm going to eat them. This is, is, is that not because it's the most addictive drug on the planet that's in there? Well, we, we have to question how the ingredients are affecting our neurology and our feeding behaviors. And this is the, the next part of the talk that I'm going to sort of... Uh, I didn't put sugar in Tesco's raw chicken. Most addictive drug in the planet. It has addictive to sugar. Well, well you put it in everything. Sugar's... So you buy another one. It's too, you know, it's too... You can put it in lots of things and you don't need it at all. Mm -hmm. if, you, if you look at the labels. Yeah, you buy salami. Yeah, don't put salami. It has a bit of sugar in it, but lots of vitamins. Yeah. Well, sh sugar shares its chemistry with alcohol, yeah. ethanol. Yeah. It uses the same. Well, having said that, 
200 years ago, we could, the babies couldn't drink the water, the soap or water from the fountains unless the mothers climbed the fountains to get a bucket, you know, a bucket of water. And so um, they were drinking, after the breast milk, they drank ale, beer, mm. right? And they were fine yeah. until the sugar arrived from Jamaica. Then they were addicts. The sugar industry has a lot of uh, ownership to, to take up. There, there are many histories behind sugar ownerships. Uh, so, yes, I, I, I think you're entirely right. If you're interested, I've done a, a very in-depth documentation of alcohol and sugar because sh sugar can trigger uh, alcoholism and vice versa. Yes. By carbohydrate loading, somebody who's uh, in a physiological state of addiction can, can get the same challenges and, and it can uh, disrupt things like thiamine pyrophosphate, which does a lot of different things. It, it participates in making uh, 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 neurotransmitters like acetylcholine and it, uh, it also functions as a neurotransmitter in the heart, which was a really interesting thing. So I, I, I have speculated in, in the work, can we use electrocardiograms to understand somebody's alcohol and sugar status? Why do they put sugar in drugs that you swallow? Mm, yeah. I, I, I think that sometimes I've seen medicines like pharmace pharmaceutical products yeah. and you look at all the uh, non-active, the non-active, the excipients and the, the non-active ingredients and it's like they've just sent somebody, oh, just go down the store cupboards and just put all the, sweep all the ends in there, <laughs> like amoxicillin with, you know, several food colourings and all, all sorts, and it's like, is this quite necessary? Uh, so I, you know, I think you're, you're... Why do the pharmaceutical companies wrap our food in dementia? Uh, sorry, wrap our pills in dementia. <laughs> aluminum foil. Aluminum foil causes dementia. No, there's a... a is it C Professor Chris Epsley? I think he's done very interesting work uh, identifying um, aggregation of alum uh, aluminium uh, or, or also aluminium <laughs> in brain tissues. Uh, so, yes, uh, aluminium is certainly a, a problematic so why metal. Why do they wrap it? Why, do they, why can't they put it like sober products are all in glass bottles? Why don't they do that? I, uh, I can only, uh, well, a, lead, a, a very good piece of work that I'm working through just now, and I think it, expo it reveals the problematic way that multinational corporations work, is uh, John Giardini's uh, book, and he wrote it with his colleague called The Illusion of Evidence-Based Medicine. Now he's not saying that science is an illusion, but he and his colleagues took the documents that were forced uh, to be revealed by pharmaceutical companies. Um, so when the courts said, no, no, to settle this case, we need this information, we've got to provide this, we've got to adjudicate. So these academics brought together all this evidence based and started going, we've got to have more checks and balances about how, uh, whether something's got a scientific evidence base. And they're, they're, they're arguing things like, uh, yes, we, we need to become much more reacquainted with uh, thinkers like Karl Popper you know, and have the evidence base 
not just uh, some of the very worrying omissions uh, by some companies. Um, and actually by the rich, in Edinburgh, the rich companies, Tesco's, um, Asta, why, why is it they wrap our food in cancer and tell us to stick it in the microwave? And the small shops in Edinburgh don't, they wrap it in glass, they're very good to us. Honestly, I, I think money has a particular capacity to make people avert their thoughts. Like, I, uh, I was reading the safety records. Uh, the, the, so the, the terrible accident of Chernobyl. Um, now, you'd imagine that we, as people, humans, are rational. <laughs> we, 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 we can act detrimentally to ourselves quite often and as in, uh, in groups. Now you can read the safety reports minute by minute. Now you have to ask what was going through the minds of these individuals who were operating the plant as they were lifting the coolant rods out of the reactor. And they had switched off the safety mechanisms. Part of the analysis was to do with uh, incentives, incentive structures in work. But this is the, the, the nuclear uh, regulators. It's very, very, very detailed because, of course, it, it affected the whole world, really. It is a terrible, terrible tragedy. But I, I think I, there, there's an example of uh, DDT. Uh, there, there's a, a video of, of uh, a guy who was hired. It is a chief scientist. And uh, they say, you know, he was told, we've got to get people on board with this stuff. Can you help? And he, so he went on camera and he said, look, this stuff is perfectly safe. And he just starts spooning it into his mouth. It's the, the idea that we're rational agents is, is problematic because we don't always act rationally. We don't always want to know the problematic things. The Amish people and the Japanese seem to be able to handle it really well. You know the Amish in America? Yeah. Saving yeah. the planet. Uh, but with the genetically modified seeds, you know, that Monsanto may grow into their land, Monsanto charges them money for it. Can you believe it? They, <laughs> are, they charge them for this. It's crazy. They are an awful blight on the world, Monsanto. It's oh, uh, a nightmare. And you know, we've got so much genetically modified food. It all comes from the States. Do you know, do you know when the Holland and Barrett, an American company, started in Manhattan, Europe, well, back in the 70s. Anyway, Holland and Barrett, you, you could buy great big bags of nuts for 6p because it told you where they were packed. They didn't tell you where they were growing, so we all knew they were from the States, so we didn't buy them. We got fed up, sold it to Russia. It's now a Russian company. And the Russians were bringing all this stuff from the Eastern, the Eastern countries. We were all in there buying it because it told you where they were growing. Now they've gone back to buying the food, the nuts, off America. And nobody's buying the nuts again. And they're Russian. <laughs> well, <laughs> well I, I think money makes people crazy. And there's a wonderful, wonderful book that's recently come out by a guy called Nicholas Shaxon, S-H-A-X-S-O-N. And his latest book is called The Finance Curse. Uh, and he's been working with the likes of John Christensen, uh, who was a former financial advisor to Jersey, who left his job and went, we have to we have to change how we're organizing our world. This is causing more problems than it fixes. And that's me putting me as polite as I can, but it's a wonderful read. I recommend Nicholas Shackson's presentations on YouTube. 
They're very, very well researched. But that kind of finance is running underneath everything, every aspect of our lives now. And it is problematic because some people will decide that maybe, maybe somebody has decided uh, all this science stuff is superstitious nonsense. Because, well, you know, they had a burger once and it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, it, who knows how to account for it? But we we can uh, we can analyze it by really good commentators, and I think the the science. You know, so I'll, I'll take you through some of the science that that I think we should be thinking about, at least conversing with, and maybe uh, contacting the companies and going. Can you change this? Because if you look at Smarties now, the food colourings, <laughs> they, yeah, the, the, you know, what a good idea using beetroot to colour things and, and the like. Uh, so I, change does sometimes happen, but it, it requires us to be informed, to have conversations, and and then say. It's, for example, Edinburgh Council. Well, the councillors are very busy, but <laughs> having a chat with them and saying, I wouldn't like you to use glyphosate on my children's school or my park where I walk my dog. Or, and glyphosate is, is you know, the jury is now <laughs> back in five decades and 360. Uh, 36 billion tons of it released in the world since 1974, and it started uh, at you know, an uh, industrial scale in Britain. You know, this was the, the ground zero of glyphosate, but it's terrible. It, 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 so yes, I, I think we should have these conversations. And I don't think we should be scared, and I don't. I think we should avoid. Uh, starting with confrontation. Diesel causes heart attacks, asthma, cancer, dementia. The combustion engine is a disaster. And it's a nanoparticle, <laughs> so it goes right through your skin, through your eyeball, through anything. Petrol is a big target molecule. It <laughs> only causes cancer because it's such a big molecule. There's five countries Could in I? Africa. If I go in with this, I get arrested. They will not allow plastic in. Kenya, there's five big countries. Put them together, bigger than Europe. Why are they saving the planet and what are we doing? Could I twist your arm to do a talk? <laughs> Sorry? Could I twist your arm to do a talk one day? Me? Yeah, you're, I, know, I know how knowledgeable you are, Elaine. <laughs> and, and it would be a real pleasure because I think all of these points are really important and good, and we need to have conversations. We need to uh, be swapping ideas. And, uh, Dynamic Earth are really into it, and so are the rangers in Arthur Sea. They want to ban diesel from Arthur Sea, the two of them. Mm -hmm. and, and petrol, electric, and bikes are allowed. You can't breathe in Arthur Sea with the diesel. It's really bad. And they tell you to get on a bike. Well, a bit of a bit of chemistry and diesel. If I'm right, it, does it end up in producing nitric oxide diesel? And so nitric oxide is a very significant biological mediator in our body. It's a powerful free radical, and it's it's a powerful oxidizing uh, uh, molecule. So, so yes, yes. Um, and I will be hitting you up for this talk. <laughs> <laughs> when I so, was a kid, there was one girl, I was in the biggest school in Edinburgh, one girl had asthma from the age of five to 18, one girl, Winnie, and I always remember her name, welcome to look after her. Now we've got two schools I know in Edinburgh where the headmistresses are so worried about the children, they put signs up, mm -hmm. do not park here, just outside the playground. They're not allowed to say Lothian buses because they're Lothian schools. 
two children don't have asthma at that one, one of the schools. You, I mean, can, that's a you can go back in the medical records and find that hay fever is a very new condition. I think it, it, don't quote me on this, I think it's something like 1814. So it's a post-industrial revolution condition. And hay fever, for those who didn't know, uh, it's, it is an allergic condition. Um, so, uh, yes, yes, I, I, these, I saw a baby with an inhaler, a baby, weeks old, in a pram with an inhaler. The other day, that's crazy. Well, do, I, I've done some work on, on asthma, so maybe one day I'll do a talk on on that. And uh, uh, it would be great to get thoughts and feedback on that. Yeah. Can I go through this next Yes, bit? of course. Thank you. So, I've been keeping my beady eyes on, on the new things that have been appearing in, in, in the food chain, particularly as... Uh, uh, anybody eat crunchy nut cornflakes? <laughs> no. <laughs> well, there, there, there are lots of these Moorish cereals, and you pour some and you have to. And uh, I, 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 would, I found this really fascinating. I'd eat a bowl, and then there would be some milk left. And I thought, well, oh, I'd better not waste, waste the milk. <laughs> so I you know, add some more, and then I'll oh, run out of milk now, so I'll just <laughs> pop it up. <laughs> And then I realized one, one day, wait a minute, I'm actually I'm physically distended. Physically, my, my, my gastric compartment is full. But I'm, I'm craving more. I'm, I'm wanting to eat more. And, and I started to notice this Moorishness. Uh, if you look, there's, there's um, barley malt extract. It's it's also it well the the it's not just sugar the the sugar um, the the stuff that I've been looking at uh, the the chemistry tunes into the opio uh, the opiate system uh, and of course sugar and high fat uh, triggers the the opiate receptors too so. Um, So the, these vegetable extracts, like you look at the side of Coca-Cola and they're mystery ingredients. <laughs> vegetable extracts. So what, what the heck are these? So I, I was digging and I was digging and uh, I found out about um, rubiscolin 6 proteins. Now, uh, I'll, I'll give some, some background on this. First, first word, Opiates. Now, an opiate is a very powerful biological substance, and they tend to be small protein peptides. A protein peptide made up of uh, maybe around five amino acids. And we find opiates throughout nature. They're involved in lots of biological functions. We, we tend to think about opiates in terms of painkilling. They're great analgesics. But they actually function in plants and animals to do all sorts of things, such as um, they, they modulate um, neuroendocrines and hormones, so growth hormone and prolactin, the estrus cycle, uh, testosterone and luteinizing hormone, um, adrenal corticotrophic stimulating hormone, luteinizing hormone, vasopressin. In, in these, these are all very important uh, biological mediators in our, in our brain and body. And the they're, they're very, very involved, vital for behaviours like feeding and drinking. Uh, they're implicated in uh, 
scenarios like uh, dementia. So memory, cognition and learning. Opiates play a very fundamental role. Uh, in emotionality, in, in our affect. In addiction, we're, many of us are aware of this because there's, uh, there's been a massive overprescription, uh, particularly in the United States. There, there are terrible epidemics there. And if you want to see some very interesting journalism, you can see John Oliver uh, last week tonight on YouTube. There, there are three different follow-up pieces of investigative journaling, journalism he and his colleagues have done, scrutinizing the, the opiate epidemic in, in America uh, and the shocking lack of morality of the companies that have been pushing the, the prescription pads. So um, the, in, they're involved in stress and shock and sleep. So this is quite a range of, of biological function and behavioral function. I thought, okay, so, so Rubiscalin 6 is this little opioid peptide derived from spinach. We all like spinach. You know, if a company says, would you like a little bit of spinach in, in your product? Oh, of course, i have watched Popeye. <laughs> yeah. But they've, they've taken one tiny element out of spinach and they've concentrated and they're using that as a flavor enhancer. Um, now an opioid, as opposed to an opiate, is it doesn't have an opiate structure as a molecule. <clears throat> it need only be a molecule that reacts with the opiate receptor and triggers an opiate uh, reaction. So uh, a, a really great example, which is in the room, <laughs> is alcohol. Did you know that alcohol works through the opiate system? Um, so alcohol, ethanol, um, it becomes acetaldehyde and then it condenses with dopamine to form tetrahydroisoquinolines. And these molecules then touch the opiate receptors and our memory goes funny and our, our motor coordination goes and we find it very funny because we, we, we can't speak properly and uh, uh, our, our urinary <laughs> continence uh, gets pressed. Um, so, so alcohol is actually partly functioning through uh, the, the opiate system. And of course, they, it is well known uh, if a, a patient has opiates, they're told, be careful about the alcohol you're drinking because they accumulate and can be deadly. So, how could spinach be that, you know, function in this way? And I, I, I realized that, yeah, there, there are patents to use this in sweet products. And there are papers um, like uh, Harita so Sonoda Agui Yoshida. <laughs> I'm... Terrible linguist, but um, I have several studies where, um, so th this particular study is Rubiscalin 6, a delta opioid peptide derived from spinach. Rubisco has anxiolytic effect via activating signal and dopamine D1 receptors. 
right? So every, every time they put this in a food product, it's having an anxiolytic effect. Uh, and it's, it's affecting the dopaminergic system. And dopamine is a very powerful neurotransmitter, uh, which, which is involved uh, in anticipation and reward. Um, if, if anybody likes the science, I highly recommend the Huberman Lab. So I think it's Stanford neuroscientists got really upset with the media, just <laughs> consistently badly reporting on all of their work. So they just, as scientists, decided to sit down in front of camera and go, well, this is what we've been working on. And they do all sorts of health studies, but it's really in-depth but palatable. Um, there's a, there are a great uh, couple on dopamine and the role that dopamine plays. And they, they give a nuanced understanding. Uh, we just should, we should just be stuffing our shoes with newspapers mostly, by and large. <laughs> um, uh, and, and turning to people like Andrew Huberman, who, who's, who's going, well, I have this perspective because I, this is the evidence base that's convinced me this way. We have tested it these ways. Without that, we, I think we're really adrift. Um, so, th this paper I mentioned uh, also reported that rubiscolin 6 had an analgesic effect. <laughs> so, so it's, it's not a small, uh, it, you know, matter. <laughs> it, it's, it's obviously biologically potent. Uh, Uh, oh, oh, yes, yes, absolutely. You don't, you don't make a patent. No, uh, I was say. Oh, I can give you the patent number as well. I, I'll, I'll, okay, I'm getting there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, well, I, I, to, to answer your question properly, I think it comes down to this. So, if you, if you imagine Ted, who's a food scientist, and uh, you know wants you know, a living and take his grandchildren to, you know, and he works for a cereal company and the cereal company goes, how can you make our product more delicious? Mm. Well, how do you measure deliciousness? More addictive then. I, if, if, if the word, if they said, if, if the higher ups went, Make our stuff addictive. That is a scandal, but the, <laughs> that, that's what they're doing. Well, look, I, I would because turn you have a delicious food, which is not addictive. Yeah, and yeah. then you're fully full. Well, if you if you can get people to eat one more bowl, one more chocolate bar, one more can, uh, if you can get people to think, oh, I'm craving this over that. And, and if you do the taste test, it's really interesting to take whole grain porridge and go, okay, I'm going to eat even with sugar. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> you know, a nice bit of demerara. <laughs> and, and I find I eat it and I can go, oh, that was really delicious. It's one of my favorite things in the world. But I can't eat anymore. Physically can't bring myself. These other products, there's some kind of override right hand. Mm. I'm going, I can't eat it anymore, but I'm, in, I'm compelled to. Mm. Now, um, Ted in the food laboratory, or, or you know, all these food scientists, they're just, right, okay, we've got lots of mice, etc. First, we have to make sure that when we give these living things something, they don't keel over and die. So that it has to be toxicologically safe, you know, within, you know, given parameters. Uh, so we've established that. Now, when we give the mice this stuff, they eat more. 
and they'll observe it and they'll go, well, is there any problem with this in the children's cereal? <laughs> you know, the mice are still alive. They're still eating. I, I, I think that's a part of it. If we look at things like the Encyclopedia of White Collar and Corporate Crime, you, yes, <laughs> Salinger wrote this, and a, f a famous example is the the Ford Punto Pinto. Fam the, there's a film called Class Action with Gene Hackman in it, and they manufactured this car and under rare circumstances when it's struck from the back left hand side whilst the indicator was on it ignited the petrol tank <laughs> and the engineers on the floor identified this and they said no this is terrible so, so we'll send that upstairs here's our safety reverse this is what we're, we're going to have to refit and the refit will take what $10.56 per unit well, how, how many units have we sold? Uh, what's the reputational damage? So the cost, the, the actuaries come in. Now, the memos then came down and they said, the, the, the chiefs said, don't act on this. It's cheaper for us not to retrofit it. So I have no doubt that some there are some people, bad actors in the world, who will say, okay, somebody get us addicted to cereal and gets obese. And, you know, that's their choice, isn't it? Or who cares? Or whatever was going on in the, the mind of somebody who... Prove it. it might be something else. Prove it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah, I, 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 I think we have to be a transparent society to deal with these kind of things. And also to, to identify when sometimes people are, uh, do things with non-malicious intention. It's just a terrible idea. Yeah. Um, so I'd, how about I finish this little section and we can refresh our glasses. <laughs> um, so, uh, the next couple of papers, we found Ribulose 6, uh, 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 sorry, Rubiscalin 6, an, a delta opioid agonist peptide derived from D Ribulose 15 biphosphate carboxylase oxygenase. Um, <laughs> these are Rubis, uh, to, to put that in context, a seed germinates and it pushes its shoots up and it, it puts its leaves out to photosynthesize. Now it needs to create these proteins to convert the light energy uh, and take in the carbon dioxide to produce sugars and growth. So that's, that's the function they're playing in the plant. Um, uh, a major pro protein of green leaves stimulates food intake after oral administration in mice. So we'll move to the next study. And uh, it's uh, Rubiscalin 6 is a food derived opioid peptide found in uh, spinach that has anti nociceptive memory enhancing anxiolytic and antidepressant effects. These effects were revealed to be mediated through delta opioid receptors. The, the orexigenic effect of rubiscalin 6 may be applicable for the treatment of anorexia and cachexia. So they're, they're going, this stuff stimulates feeding. Maybe there is a clinical application for this. And... <laughs> but of course <laughs> uh, and, and just to finish uh, if you look up Google patents uh, US 801716 b 2 you'll find this patent 
high potency sweetener composition with rubisco protein, rubiscolin, rubisco uh, lin derivatives, ACE inhibitory peptides, and combinations thereof, and combinations sweetened therewith, <laughs> um, um, are owned by, I, I think we already got to the company name, didn't we? Uh, Coca Cola owned these patents. Why is it the most popular soft drink in the world? We do need to question whether is it caffeine is it sugar is it rubiscolin proteins is it the combination of all three that make people want more and, and I am doing a large study on opiate chemistry and opioidal chemistry to see what research there is to, to so say somebody's trying to stop drinking alcohol and they have a Coca-Cola and they drink all this Coca-Cola you know, or something with rubiscolin in it. So that's hitting the same opioidal systems. And the person will be, you know, this, this is my question. Will the, the person be sitting there going, Oh, I, I'm, I'm dying for a drink. And would they not be triggered to do that if they weren't drinking that? These are the kind of scientific studies we need to be doing. And then the alcohol industry are very reticent of going and recognizing this is an opioidal substance. Uh, I mean, they, they sued, sued the Scottish government when the government said we should uh, do minimum unit prices because people are drinking themselves to death on this nasty cheap cider. Uh, thankfully, the government won on that. So, um, uh, and uh, that's a good time to have a, a break and refresh. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, we, 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 we left off uh, with the, the opioid molecules being used as flavor enhancers in foods. Um, and and I, I started seeing uh, another thing appearing on the side of products. Uh, who, who has seen you, uh, made with fortified wheat flour mm -hmm. no. and, <laughs> and and you'll see in certain breakfast cereals, oh, we've added vitamins mm -hmm. and and it gives a sort of a slight vague ethereal sense. They must be nice. <laughs> and I looked into it and I realised, well, in... Did you know that in 2008, the, it was the world's biggest ever wheat harvest? The, the more wheat was harvested than ever in, in, in that year than ever before. And what happened on the stock markets was reported by the United Nations Special Rapporteur on the Human Right to Food. Because a food bubble happened and uh, speculators, financial speculators, started buying it all up to increase the price that they would get. So by creating, making it scarce, they could ask more for it. Um, and... Once you've bought all that wheat, what the heck do you do with it? Well, one of the things you can do with it is mill it down and remove anything, you know, separate out anything that supports life. You know, because we share a lot of our biology 
with things like uh, microbes and you know living things share a lot of biology. So if you take all the things that life needs to thrive out of something, it's got great shelf life. <laughs> the problem is that uh, governments say you are not allowed to sell this without restoring it to a minimal nutritional value. Thus, they have to fortify this. Uh, it, it's effectively pure <laughs> starch. So, so it's not done for through philanthropy. Um, it's it's done because people were keeling over because there is not the range of biological molecules we need. Well, uh, the vitamins, the minerals, the essential fats. The you know, in fact, cereals. Apart from whole grain things, um, I, I would cast doubt on them being regarded as a foodstuff at all. I, I think the, the people who live off of cereals would likely end up with frank uh, and dire deficiencies and biological breakdowns. And we remember, we, we do find, we are finding cases of scurvy in Britain in modern times. We are finding uh, lots of uh, subclinical deficiencies. What year was I did not make wheat? Now, did it not? Did it not two glasses together to make wheat? It was, was, it, was, was, was it a salt? Was it? No, 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 no. I, there, there's an older grain from which wheat was bred. I, this, this is a very interesting question because it is, it's fascinating. I'm, I'm blown away by the, the history of the ancients, the ancient knowledges. Like arboriculture. How how strange it is and how hard it is to grow trees, you know, and certain trees and plants. It's it had to be some. Um, I, I I just I can't conceptualize how it was done because certain things only ha became understood can be understood over a time span that are, is longer than the life of an individual. Uh, and it is fascinating. Apparently the apple was developed in uh, northeast Turkey. Are you, are you that wheat was invented, uh, two glasses rubbed together, and it went worldwide because the insects wouldn't eat it. <laughs> worldwide, everybody wanted to grow it because the insects wouldn't eat it. But all the parts in Edinburgh, the council were put up signs saying, do not feed the birds wheat because it kills them. Oh, it Check it out, every park, every council park, mm. Arthur C. at the Rock, they've all got signs. Well, it... You know, the, the grains and the, the, the way things have changed from, uh, so a, a farm might do several crops. Um, you know, so if we go back 100, 200, 500, 1,000 years, you'd have a lot more diversity. And you'd have hedgerows, you'd have lots more, much, much more woods, you'd have... Uh, thriving uh, soil biome with fungi, and these are all working together. There's a really brilliant scientist called Susan Simard uh, who has worked out that trees 
look like they're talking to each other. And they're actually supporting each other. When one tree will get sick, another will send nutrition to support uh, its kith and kin. Uh, her, her, her work is, is really fascinating. Um, so, um, yeah, you know, like, now if we look at the agricultural landscape, we've got these vast monocultures. You know, somebody's decided to plant 100 hectares of one thing. And all it takes is for the thing that likes eating that crop to appear, to just ravage it. And uh, they, they, they will <coughs> thrive. And then the idea of these big monocultures is to, well, we'll just use po things that are poisonous to the bugs to, to save our crops. But here's the kicker. What's really interesting, I've found, is when, a, when a, a bug comes along and nibbles a plant, a plant will produce all kinds of biological adaptations to f fight off the bug. It will become, the plant will become more nutritious. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, I, I, I've, I've been looking at the effects of glyphosate. James Long, he wrote quite a lot on that. Right. And right. he sort of explains that if you crush a garlic, it doesn't like it, so it starts fighting back. If you get the nutrients in the garlic, if you eat the garlic once it's crushed, you get a more nutrient power, more nutrient value out of it than if you just eat it straight. Yeah, straight. <laughs> and it is the same with lettuce. If you, if you sort of tear it and damage it a bit, even if it's already been harvested, it still kind of has this. Yeah. So, so yeah, we, we we need the the insect species to come along, and uh, the insect species not just produce cause the, the plants to produce all these nutrients, but we get lots more flavors. You know, they become more interesting vegetables. <laughs> like like uh, the, the the tomato. I mean, who who thinks it's a good idea to grow these tasteless bags of water? Uh, I, no wonder people have just ejected, you know, there's, there's a whole culture of people who have avoided vegetables. I think because, <laughs> yeah, there's nothing in them, they're tasteless, there's, you know, it, it might be a more expensive consuming these badly produced, chemically uh, battered plants. Um, so, the, our, our food landscape has changed so much, um, you know, that it, it does, we are what we eat. And the, the way that animals are, you know, livestock keeping have gone from um, some animals to vast numbers. So, so much so that in Wales, the river, uh, the rivers have become so polluted because they've just been planting these massive flat pack chicken barns all the way down the river. And these chickens don't get out to see light or, you know, they're, they're, there's, we can't equate it to the life of a living thing anymore, I don't think. Um, and so vets have, have come along and gone, well, all your animals are dying, so what we'll, we'll do is standardly dose them with antibiotics and other drugs. Uh, and, and we get exposed to that. So the, the antibiotics in some cases are, are just standardly in the feed. Uh, and some farmers like it because it boosts the size and the bulk and it's... it's they, they feed, the, as soon as animals are born, the farmers give them antibiotics. That's why it's not good for us to eat their meat 
if you've got a if you've got an infection, you have to go on antibiotics because antibiotics won't work. Yeah, uh, uh, antibiotic resistance. Uh, it's a very big issue, and it's my, my it's a sensitive yeah. one because our our medical system is telling us. I'm not. I'm going to resist giving you antibiotics because we want to preserve the antibiotic stocks because they are so useful in certain medical circumstances that we can't bankrupt that uh, biomedical tool. But we've got to get the farmers in the rooms with the doctors and go, look, do you want your great-grandson when he has a a dangerous infection to be treatable. And, uh, or, or, or do you want in, uh, exorbitant profits? I do think it's may, maybe, uh, again, back to the, the multinational corporate structures, whereby it's maybe not individuals. We, we picture in our minds uh, farmers with their their traditional kit on, looking out the horizon, wondering, is it going to rain today? You know, chewing a bit of grass. But it's it, it's almost entirely fully automated. It's people who are bought in brought, and brought in to manage vast amounts of land for high profit, high yield. And how do we get people to be attracted to values other than financial gain when, when it means health and the like. And our food chain is, is becoming bankrupted. And we can see that with the development of disease uh, and illnesses in, in our industrial prop- populations. Um, uh, so, at some point in, uh, the, the, you know, cultures decide we should really make a rule about this. <laughs> uh, mm. And so law comes in and collectively there's, there's an understanding. If we poison everybody, it's no good. <laughs> it doesn't make for a good life. So let's let's maybe not do that again, you know. We you know, and you get things like the no. You, I'm going to do another terrible pronunciation, but the Einheitsgebot rule, the the, 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 the the German law purity laws, and you'll often see them referenced. This beer can only be made from. I think it's water, hops, and barley. They're not allowed any extra ingredients. But that's no sugar. <laughs> well, there's sugar in barley. No, no, I'm not talking about cooked. I'm talking about sugar cane. I, I, there may be a beer made with sugar cane. I, I think the German. Law actually goes back to the guilt system in the medieval times, yeah. probably when any sugar wasn't available. Mm-hmm. It, was well, it, start- wasn't, it hadn't come from Jamaica yet. Well, it started off as a guild law, which became encapsulated in German law. Ah. 1516, oh. Bavaria started, you know, I think it went, went back further. I, I didn't realise the guilds, I mean, the guilds make sense. The professionals talking, like, well, we, we make damn, damn good beer. <laughs> the, the guild system was actually very good from lots of points of view, because it was, um, it furthered skills and training, it kept quality standards up, it kept products pure, and uh, they had a social network, and it was connected to local suppliers. Mm-hmm. It's a little bit like Fusion's view of the world in 1493 as opposed to 1893. In a way, given different circumstances, and it was through rose-coloured glasses, 
that there was an almost a more sustainable and um, environmentally to sound local based city system than there was in the Victorian industrialization. I, I, it wasn't long ago I, I heard the origin of the word masterpiece. <laughs> this gentleman told me. Uh, it's, uh, I, I didn't realize that at the end of an apprenticeship, the, 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 the crafts person would put all their skills into this piece. Uh, to to exhibit. Have I done done that justice? So far, good. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and of course, apprenticeships that that social ecology, which um, which is political economy, um, that that that's been heavily eroded by financialism, stark mania of finance, pursuing finance, uh, and, and we don't see the apprenticeship scheme, or, or I, I, are the guild system still operating at all? Not really. No, right. There are just one or two, but it's all beginning with industrialization and the specialization and division of labor, more or less eliminating the guild system. Yeah. And the commoditization of materials, and that really it began with the railway system. I happen to be an historian amongst other things, I can borrow your brows. Oh, well, I, <laughs> may I twist your arm to do that? <laughs> please, <laughs> please, please do uh, consider doing a talk. I'd, like, I'd love to hear that. So the his, uh, histories are uh, shed so much light on the world we're actually living in. Well, we are everything we think can do is a consequence of everything other people have thought and done. We are the living embodiment of your history of us. Indeed, indeed. Uh, the, you know, so, taking that point and leading back to, to where we, we are now, the, the production of foods, you know, how, how did, how, how did all of culture get fed, um, it, it was protected by various statutes. Laws were introduced to protect the, 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 the things that were well done. Did you know that there was a, a statute passed on the adulteration of coffee? Yeah. In, in, in 1718, the Adulteration of Coffee Act was passed in, uh, as an act of parliament in Great Britain concerning the adulteration of coffee, which made it legal to debase coffee. Illegal? Illegal. It's illegal to debase coffee. And I don't, I suspect that some of this is not, <laughs> not actively followed up as a statute. I don't know whether, how, how whether it's uh, been, uh, what, what do they do, decommission? statutes for but I guess in 1780 and because coffee houses and I, I, I spoke to a guy who who his theory or about coffee houses and tea was that they contributed greatly to the enlightenment because finally people had something other than alcohol to sit <laughs> down and so drinking coffee and have sprightly conversations and salons, of, you know. Uh, uh, so, so Does coffee have glutamates? Glutamates? I would have to check. Um, Maybe that they were actually having more intelligent conversations <laughs> as well as less drunken ones. <laughs> Do you know that Lloyd's of London started as a coffee house? Yeah. And Lloyd's sold coffee, and on the wall, they would write the weather reports. Yeah. And so the merchants would meet there, and they could go, well, that's the predicted weather, and they would be uh, 
entrepreneurs. They would be putting their capital up. And uh, the, the people who had the ships and the cargoes, they knew maybe, okay, maybe 10 ships make it across the Atlantic. Maybe one gets hit by a, a, a squall. We use one-tenth of it, but that's what we need investment for. So the stock markets came partly around uh, the, the, the coffee, coffee in the weather, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Very uh, British. That's your question. Mm -hmm. Rapeseed. Mm -hmm. when, when was um, rapeseed invented? I have not. Because <laughs> rapeseed is... Um, causes a lot of hay fever here. Really bad for hay fever, rape seed. People that don't get hay fever, they really get hay fever. And they don't get it from grass, but they get it from rape seed. Really bad for that. Devastated weed when grape seed became a common crop in Scotland, a very badly asthmatic, and I'm with it as a child. But about 10 years ago, when rapeseed became a common um, crop, it, it made my sinuses sensitised, and then even grass pollen and other pollens and other things, I can be ill for months because of it. Yeah. And it, the trigger is usually about April. Rapeseed, the flowers quite early, usually about April, it kicks in, and it's usually about September. Before them coming out of it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, is, is it, I mean, are you suggesting that rapeseed was actually invented or did it grow somewhere else and then it imported here and then it grew here too or what? Mm -hmm. Because the rapeseed, it, I always thought rapeseed was a natural product that came from somewhere. I don't know, but look at it. I think it might have come from America, so I don't, I don't, I don't think rape was at all in the medieval times. So selective breeding has always been a very uh, strong tool in the toolkit of uh, agriculturalists. So we can go out and find, uh, I've always wanted to do this over a couple of years because I, I am I'm sure that we can do it. We can go and find a wild parsnip and pull it out and it's just basically a root, a stringy root with no tuber. But by selective breeding over time, you take, you know, this fat one with this fat one, you can fairly quickly plumpen them up. Uh, <laughs> and I, I'd, I'd love to do, try that as a proof of the pudding. Um, so have you heard of the expression ersatz food? Ersatz food? It's a, a, a German term, I think. Was it Ursatz? Ursatz. Yeah. Ursatz. Yeah. Ursatz. Yeah. 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 That's the, the cause, yeah. Um, Ursatz. So, uh, when it comes from the, from the root. Mm -hmm. It means false. Mm -hmm. Ursatz translates as false, doesn't it? I don't, I don't speak German, unfortunately. Ursatz is just the cause. Mm -hmm. The cause, where it comes from. I think it means alternative, but yeah. right. <laughs> <laughs> an alternative. Yeah. In, in, I know that he's read World War II stories, and those that uh, it's something that basically got more and more of the longer you spent in a prison camp. Yes. <laughs> Everything you got in a prison camp was ersatz. Ah. ah. So. Ersatz. Er 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 well, how's it spelled? Yeah. Yeah. Ah, that's 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 yeah, that is what you no. substitute for something else. Yeah. Ah, yeah. substitute, that's the word. Subst ah, yeah. ah. ah, I was going to say something completely different. So, <laughs> yes, my, I, 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 my, I, I, I only speak one language and that's bad English, <laughs> unfortunately. So, so yeah, so the, the practice of bulking out foods with non-nutritional yeah. stuff. Uh, and as I learned about this from reading about the Second World War, and... They did it with coffee, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but you can't understand why. <laughs> it's, yeah, it is. I mean, it with coffee, so you get sort of the taste of it, and I think coffee. But yeah, yeah. And they added chalk to flour, I believe, as well, but that was from yeah, the right. Right. Victorian right. time. That goes back even further than... Yeah, that was... 
it's yeah. How, how many merchants have sort of bought in something all good quality and then gone, oh, just mix in some of that? We get uh, the same thing happening in in certain pubs. They'll they'll water down the spirits uh, and so on. So, so of course, where, where there's money to be made, bad behaviour uh, it, it potentially emerges. Right, the co-op society started because of that very reason, and there were people, local people, that pooled the resources to buy directly from producers and redistribute what they knew was an unadulterated product. And that led to all sorts of financial profit of societies, which has been the basis of building societies as well. Very interesting. And actually, the colonies in Edinburgh, the first one that stopped out, started off as a cooperative. Right. There were loads of colonies all around Edinburgh. See, they... anyway, no, 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 no. <laughs> I, I, I love, I love uh, ragged university events because I learn. <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, you know, I'm trying to learn to become a better communicator, and uh, I, I, I hope. I've not dragged you through too many edges. <laughs> um, the colonies in Stockbridge, they've got a little brick uh, mural thing to tell you when they were built. And they they actually live in the colony. The people that built. Yeah. Well, uh, they were actually, they were built they each trades and you'll actually sometimes see the guild symbol yeah. of the trade, the carpenters or slaters or masons or whatever, yeah. yeah. and they started at one end and worked their way along. That's right. Yeah. And then the latest and ones... Have you heard the little thing on the brick that they made? It's Stockbridge. Yeah, at the end table, yeah, it's usually, actually, from, you know, yeah. usually from the about, the start, about yeah. 1840 to about 1860, when they yeah. managed to spend yeah. enough money to so I don't know. I don't, I'd love to know more about Edinburgh. You know, although I've you know been born and grown up here, I know hardly little about such a. I, it also seems like every time I walk through the city, I notice something new. Um, there is ever uh, uh, ever more to see. Anyway, so I will. So the next example that I've I've uh, identified were situations like so we're we're moving into the area of food crime. Crime. For, yes, food crime, and uh, you know laws were passed, but not not just to preserve quality of goods, but to protect people. And you get situations like uh, use of grain, which is destined for agriculture. And when that is diverted and used to create foods, it, it's poisoned whole populations because seeds will be coated in uh, a pesticide. So there's a very famous case in the, the Middle East, where they just diverted hundreds of tons of grain, but it was all covered in ethyl mercury. Wow. Yeah. And uh, it was specified not for human consumption. No, you know, it was not, it's to be planted specifically. But there's another, another thing as well, like uh, we, we can't draw very neat lines because we're planting this in the soil, that ethyl mercury goes into the environment. Yeah? Mm -hmm. the, the industrial agri uh, agricultural fertilizers, these are, are delivering vast amounts of cadmium into the soils, another heavy metal, but not, not good for us. And we, we get exposure to it. Um, so I, I, I tuned into two particular books. Um, uh, John W. Spink's book, Food Fraud P Prevention, Introduction, Implementation and Management. You can, 
you can tell it's a riot. <laughs> uh, but it, I, I really, you know, I, I like to be aware of just how deep this subject is going, uh, along with a handbook of crime, uh, uh, immoral and illegal practices in the food industry and what to do about them. Uh, and that's policy press at the University of Bristol. So, so to, to, to sort of round off the evening, I'll just briefly go through some of the, the topic headings of what constitutes food crime. Uh, so this uh, sec section one, um, you've got food crime without criminals, agri-foods safety governance. So, the, so the fudging of governance to allow certain things to happen. Um, the. The social construction of illegality within local food systems. So I guess uh, the, it's it's very attractive w when people are making a living to to get involved, and and that can be sort of uh, easily adopted, particularly when people are are, are needing an income. Um, and they're, they're talking about uh, ethical challenges which are facing, uh, facing farm managers. So when, when animals are in constant pain, I never see an, a, a natural environment when they're emotionally distressed, when they're shipped around lots of different places. And, it is, it is a crime that the cruelty against animal is recognised uh, slowly and surely as, as something that we shouldn't be doing. Um, and chocolate. <laughs> chocolate, slavery, forced labour, child labour and the state. And I'm thinking about the power of wealth. So in uh, 2008, you've got the UN starting to report on famines that were deliberately caused. You've got... Um, uh, deliberately caused. Oh, lots of famines have been deliberately caused. Uh, so you know about the Great Famine in Ireland. Uh, more food was being exported from Ireland uh, in, uh, during the Great Famine um, than previous years. So you can see the ledgers. This is the food that's going out of the country. And they, uh, at the time, they were saying, well, there's a potato blight. That's why all these poor people are, are dying and starving. But the, the ledgers have, have, are there and scholars have gone over them. Um, but if you look at uh, Professor Gene Zeigler and his work, Betting on Famine, his book. Now, he was the UN Special Rapporteur on the uh, human right to food for eight years. And he went all over the world um, examining this and championing the, the, the cause. And he points out that, well, yes, there's the speculation. So say we all like coffee. If I buy up the coffee and you all really want an espresso, I can go, well, how much money have you got? £10 an espresso? Now, being a coffee lover myself, yes, I would pay £10 for a nice coffee when it came to it, because I would miss it. But when it comes to staple foods, oh, think about rice and potatoes and uh, lentils and sorghum and wheat. Uh, uh, they, 
Nilay spec financial speculators went well if we we will set the price here. So uh, uh, Frederick Kaufman also wrote a book on this called Bet the Farm. And uh, does everybody remember Live Aid and Ethiopia? So the amount of food that was being exported from Ethiopia, whilst those famines were being, you know, we had pop stars going, look, you know, we're buy our, our, our singles and, and the like. So, so the, the United Nations work on this um, reveals a moral vacuum. There's, there's no other way to put it. Uh, and unfortunately, yes, people will, when they're so distant from the problem, they will abandon uh, responsibility for the... the the fellow human on the other side of the planet, or just outside, out of earshot, really. Um, and, and if you're interested on this, you, I've written a lot about this on the Ragged University website. There are several articles where take you to documents, links, uh, references, and uh, yes, it's a, and I see this. Simply as a food crime, yeah, and and there's the amount of wastage that goes on. I remember at some point uh, hearing about the beef and butter mountains of the EU, and eggs being tipped into the sea, and to make sure the price was here and not here. Wine lakes, I've heard about. I, I've eaten EC uh, stewed steak because they can, they eventually can stuff and they, they couldn't yes. get rid of it they and they couldn't sell it. Um, so the, the impact of hazardous substances and pesticides on farmers and farming communities. So, yeah, the, the, the things that are being used to disrupt the natural ecologies of the world also disrupt our biology. Um, the, the, you know, the, some certainly more than others. Some are absolutely clearly... Uh, uh, Disastrous. Uh, some are so many of things are introduced with that, uh, that we yet to know about, and they have to deal with these in sewage plants as well because okay. it all goes in there and they have to get their process engineers and they have to then go, Right, this is the stuff we know about, uh, this is the stuff we deal about. Uh, we know how to deal with this stuff. We have no idea. We some of the stuff we don't even know how to speculate on. Um, but it's it's in our food and it uh, like glyphosate. I've been very interested in uh, five decades of, of research later. They said it was very specific. It only hard, you know, deals with broadleaf plants, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It breaks down instantly. And now, five decades on, it affects. We know that it affects so soil biome, fish, uh, amph uh, amphibians, small mammals, humans. If it lives, it seems to be significantly uh, affected. And the the company said. Well, it blocks the shikimate pathway, and that only exists in these plants. So it's, we've not got the shikimate, this metabolic pathway. So it's, got a, it's, it's fine. And it has other properties, like uh, it's, it interferes with acetylcholine, which is, a, again, a neurotransmitter. 
that's involved in moods and memory and learning. So Roundup uh, should be jettisoned for use like the, did you know that vinegar can be used as a weed killer? Uh, um, <laughs> oh, well, <laughs> cheap, cheap and useful. Um, so agency and responsibility, the, the case of the food industry and obesity. So creating uh, addictive foods and foods that, that's so, uh, like Elena's point, just ramming sugar into everything. Eventually we get diabetes and this is an ever growing problem, even though there's such deep research on it. And, and it's very treatable. It's treatable through dietary intervention. Uh, people can, there are now cases of people coming back from type 1 diabetes through intervention. Uh, we, at one point, they just they said, no, impossible. But um, uh, people who don't expose themselves to things that are oxidizing the pancreas and the tissues, uh, we, we recover um, function. Um, I, and the, there's a whole mass, lot, lo, lots more. I'll, I'll finish on this one now. Uh, mass salami salmonella poisoning by the Peanut Corporation of America. You hear that, Arlene? <laughs> um, so th th this is, uh, you know, lessons in state corporate food crime. And I'll, I'll put all of this onto the, the website so you, people can go in at their own leisure to check out some of the links. Um, and uh, I, are there any thoughts on, on the subject that you'd like to share before we wrap up? I've got one. A of should the science behind sulfates and wine and I find that all the research seems to be funded by wine producers. And I'm trying to find any independent studies, and I haven't really found any. Does anybody here have any views on whether sulfates in wine, as a wine producer, see it into utter nonsense, and the natural killing sulfates in wines are perfectly happy with? All we do is um, feed some very slightly in wine. wine. So, <coughs> would anybody else? Has anybody else got music? Well, the thing is that the even proper read means that organic wine, what they actually call organic wine or sulfate free wine, is just a marketing ploy in itself. Well, there's no actual added sulfates. But they no, you can't get wine without sulfates. So well, yeah, not added sulfates, yeah. but all wine has sulfates. Yeah. So well, all they can say in the sulfate free wine is no added sulfates, but yeah. they can grow the grapes in certain conditions, so they have more sulfates. I know oh, that my friend of mine gets really bad headaches when she drinks wine, which has got the added sulfates. Yeah. But when she drinks wine without the added sulfates, yeah, she's exactly. fine. So that suggests that whatever the natural sulfites are, then are 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 well, totally that, that would make sense. But then yeah. every time I try to um, think about this and analyze what's going on, mm. that's a lot more complicated than that. Yeah. And <laughs> I'm suspect you might not be able to buy any one that doesn't have higher sulfite levels than a property that's natural. I think there's a wine bar at the top of this block called spry that there's lots of natural, what we call natural wines. Well, natural wines. Oh, I know. It's, it's but I want to ask, I know it's not very well. I'd be able to do it. She's a straight sexual person. But today was the drunk. And she was telling me that she was in the fire of red wine. They don't know why. They don't drink. And she said, I have decided that I'm sure what they were all put in one. Why not buy that wine anymore? So, 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 so,
I will have to translate it. She doesn't speak English, so I have to find out. Where are we from? They're from Oman. My sister lives in Oman. She brought them over with her business. Mm, Can I take you with a date? Mm. Oh, I'm not very nice. I don't trust that. So you see that which are very naturally grown developed sulfates in the Yes, yes, you do. But on the bit of Thank you very much. That was really interesting. There's quite a lot to do. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'm, I'm, I'm glad you enjoyed it. Uh, it is um, yeah. it's a big subject. It's a massive subject. Yeah. Yeah. We did well to gallop through all of that. <laughs>